So uh, welcome everybody to what I know is, is going to be a really interesting webinar um, with DABSA providing an essential enforcement update for us. Um, I hope everyone's well. Um, over the last year, every business or organisation, you, us, DBSA, have been affected in some way by the COVID pandemic. Uh, and we've had to find new ways of working our way uh, through this. Um, before we move on to the, um, the main uh, business of the day, um, can we just go through one or two housekeeping points and explain how this, this webinar works? Um, this is what's called a, a hybrid webinar. Um, so the presentations you will receive are actually pre-recorded, um, but the speakers and I are here with you now um, at, on this webinar live to answer the questions as we go and also at the end. Um, a few further points. Remember that the webinar will be available for uh, other people to see on request. So don't say anything or write anything that's uh, confidential or sensitive that you don't want to be circulated. <clears throat> if you've got any comments to make, then you'll see on the right hand side, there's a chat facility. So use that for, uh, for anything you want to say there. But ideally, if you have any questions, there's a facility right at the very bottom. If you scroll down to the bottom and look on the left hand side, you'll see that there's a button there which says question uh, and you'll be able to see when questions have been answered uh, or not at the bottom. We'll work our way uh, through those. If there are any questions that need a bit more detailed information, then we'll arrange for that to be uh, sent out uh, to participants um, at some stage after the, uh, after the webinar. Also at the bottom, I won't go through them uh, in, in, in detail, there are some poll questions which we'd like you to answer. These aren't related to um, DBSA uh, enforcement, but more about how COVID ha has impacted on you so far and how you think it will impact on your business. We'd be really grateful if you could, uh, if you could provide us with that, uh, with that feedback. So anyway, um, the business of today, our webinar, we'd um, normally at this point be having our road transport conference in early November. Uh, but for obvious reasons, we've had to cancel that and we're replacing that with a, a number of short webinars. And um, we're always grateful to DVSA for providing a, uh, their important updates. They were already booked in um, for our conference um, that should have taken place last week. Uh, and you'll recall that Dave Wood kindly um, gave a presentation last year at our conference, which was incredibly well received uh, about uh, roadside enforcement. So um, I thought what we'd do is ask them to come along, give us an update about uh, a number of things, uh, including the announcement in, in August when uh, DBSA indicated there were going to be changes to, to maintenance inspection visits and what operators can, uh, can expect. Um, there are going to be two parts uh, to this presentation. First of all, Dave Wood and then Mark Horton. One presentation will, will follow the other. Um, in the first part, we'll be looking at prohibitions, MSIs, so that's most serious infringements, uh, roadworthiness defects, what triggers a maintenance inspection by DVSA, and if there is one, what they're looking at. Uh, then we'll be looking at what the most common driver's hours errors, what is an, uh, an effective management system, what should the transport manager uh, be doing. So I hope you'll find this uh, really useful. Uh, and first up will be Dave Wood, who will introduce himself and lead you through his presentation. Over to you, Dave. Uh, thank you, Tim. Morning, everyone. Um, so yes, uh, David Wood, uh, DVSA Enforcement Policy Manager, been with the agency now uh, about 20 years. And uh, th thanks, Tim, for, for the intro. And I'll just, um, you know, as, as Tim's already mentioned about, we're, get, we're going to go through some uh, S marking uh, criteria, maintenance investigation updates. As Tim has mentioned, it's been um, uh, in August. Uh, uh, an important concession that, that's actually been uh, put out there, which uh, you may not be aware of yet, which is to do with delayed prohibitions, and then an update around 10 year old tyres with some legislation changing uh, in February. So, so let me uh, start by going through prohibition endorsement. And something uh, that um, you may be aware of, I mean, I think most people on the call 
I'll be aware of prohibitions uh, that uh, DVSA can issue for, for unroadworthy vehicles. Uh, and we've got uh, what we call endorsements of those prohibitions, and uh, most notably, uh, what we call an ASMART prohibition. And, and you'll see as I go through the presentation why it's important to understand what this ASMART prohibition means. So, so if it's live with you in the audience, I'll be asking the audience, well, what does it mean? Well, obviously, I can't do that. So uh, it means uh, a significant failure or an indication of a significant failure of roadworthiness compliance. Uh, so that's what the endorsement is on, on certain prohibitions. There's various reasons why we would put that SMART endorsement on a prohibition. So I'll go, go through these. So there's a common one is a long standing defect. It should have been found and, and repaired at the last safety inspection. So that's one reason why we'd SMART the prohibition. Another reason would be the driver should have detected it uh, before using the vehicle. The other reason, and again, around the driver related is that the performance uh, or handling or warning systems, it should have been obvious to the driver. So re really easy example of, you know, smash mirror, uh, things like that, warning lights on the dash that would have been obvious to the driver. Poor workmanship, and we'll, we'll see some of that as we're going through the presentation, um, that, you know, can have happened. Um, this one is a particular one to, uh, annual tests, uh, and this is, you know, not everybody realises that prohibitions can be asked marked at annual tests. So if you present the vehicle and it's got prohibition items on there, then it can be asked marked. And then finally, the if, if there's a number of uh, more sort of um, minor defects, still prohibition items, uh, but there's uh, obviously a number of them to indicate there's no maintenance going on. Uh, so that's the six reasons, uh, the main reasons for S marking and prohibition. And that's all very well to be saying about uh, prohibition endorsement. But uh, the important thing is what, what does it do? So what effect does an S mark prohibition do? For uh, so we have um, driver culpable, uh, as I mentioned. So we've got the two, uh, two um, that's smart reasons for driver, so he should have spotted it on the walk around check, or he should, he should have noticed it as he was driving the vehicle. And that could then lead to a fixed penalty or report to court for the driver. So that's important for the driver. For the operator, they, they need to understand that, I think everybody knows what OCRS is, Operator Compliance Risk Score that we hold. Uh, and for smart prohibitions, it actually doubles the points for the defect on that encounter. So, your S, so, so the S mark will rapidly increase your OCRS points. It automatically generates a follow up, and that's one of the reasons why I really wanted to emphasize um, S mark prohibitions, uh, because it generates an operator follow up. Um, so, we'll, we'll be asking questions around why that uh, prohibition was issued with the operator. Uh, the other aspect is, as Tim mentions, it, it also may indicate a most serious infringement. Uh, for roadworthiness. So we'll move on to that next. So um, you may have heard of MSIs or most serious infringements. So, so I'll explain what that is as, as sort of high level terms for roadworthiness. And it's it's generated from what we call a category one, and, and there it appears again, SMART prohibition. So category one is the most serious type of prohibition that we, we find or uh, defect that we find, which is associated to brakes steering wheels tires or suspension and category one means that the um the vehicle is immediately dangerous as we see it and it's also linked with that um you know uh, infringement of roadworthiness compliance um what we what the msi actually uh, would be triggered from is it also it's a penalty or conviction incurred by the trap by the transport manager operator so it's linked to, to either one of those entities. So the transport manager operator has to be uh, committing that offence. And just importantly, as we go through the maintenance investigation follow-up, all MSI cases will be reported back to the traffic commissioner, regardless of the outcome after that follow-up, all cases will be reported back to them for consideration. So that's most serious infringement. Um, again, um, for those of you non-engineers in the audience, um, you know, I could point out the, the defect, but <laughs> I think I'm joking. But the, these are actual 
defects that we found at the side of the road were quite horrifying. And, and I'm sure you agree um, that if we estimate these quite justifiably, as you can see, um, frightening condition of brakes, tyres, um, and these are all real examples that we find at the roadside. Um, so brake changes hanging off, obviously just happened. Uh, this is an interesting one. So as I, I said about, um, you know, this is a fairly recent where we've been finding manipulation to emission systems. So that's some examples of where we found them, um, emulators fitted to the emissions control system. And of course, that's as smart because of the, um, you know, the maintenance procedures. These, these should not have been fitted. Um, that's marking our load security. So, so when we originally um, carried out load security enforcement, we didn't S mark uh, prohibitions for, for uh, a period of time. Now it is. And as you can see, uh, you, you would think the driver may have noticed that as they were driving along, but they certainly couldn't see down the side of it. Um, as you can see inside, that was what was going on. So that would be now an S mark prohibition for load security. Um, so, um, now we've sort of covered what S marking is and, and had a look at a few of the, the defects that, that were caused and some of the horrendous things that we find. Um, what uh, I mentioned about follow up, so, so of course, the, the first thing at the top of the list that generates follow up for maintenance is this S mark prohibition. Um, and then we also have uh, intelligence reports that, that we get in regularly um, into our uh, intelligence unit. Uh, so they, they will be considered to follow up. Uh, so that could trigger a maintenance investigation. We've obviously talked about uh, no serious infringements and, uh, and that will automatically trigger an investigation. And again, we report back to OTC. Serious incidents, so this could be a collision, it could be a wheel off incident, it could be something that's reported to us by the police or highways where we would actually uh, follow that up. Um, it could be a topping up of OCRS, so you know, as, you, uh, as your OCRS goes up, then that would be flagged to us um, and that could generate a follow up. It could be automatically generated from the Traffic Commissioner's request. So, a Traffic Commissioner may have interest. Uh, for certain reasons that would generate a, a follow-up visit. And something that's recently, you know, um, that, that we may have uh, heard about is the space assessments. And this is where, you know, particularly now with COVID, where we've been carrying out more desk based work, uh, not being able to go out. But where we have unsatisfactory desk based assessments, that could actually generate a visit. So um, they're, they're the main reasons of why we'd actually carry out a maintenance investigation. And um, we, we sort of, you know, key objectives really of what we want to do with that investigation. And the, fir the first thing really is, that, and quite a sort of fundamental one, is establish the legal entity and make sure that's correct. And we do see quite often where we have changes um, uh, to, to, you know, the uh, entity on the licence which haven't been reported correctly or, or administered properly. Um, we need to make sure that the transport manager or responsible person has this effective management control of the business and the, the operators so the satisfactory systems and, and obviously you know the maintenance investigation is, is looking at the the, uh, the maintenance systems, the facilities, all the arrangements that, that uh, make sure the fleet of the vehicles that, uh, are maintained and are roadworthy. Uh, we look at contracted out maintenance and making sure that's suitable and the suitable contracts are in place. Um, we'll, Luke and we'll, we'll go on to this in a little bit more detail about looking at the maintenance inspections and how we analyse those and what we look for. So we'll, I'll cover that in a slide uh, of how we, we do that. Um, importantly, looking at walk around checks and how they're done, how effective they are, whether the drives are, are correctly reporting defects and whether they're getting rectified. So that's an important part of the, the visit. Looking at authorised operating centres, how they're being used and whether they're, they're using ones that they shouldn't be. Um, so that, they're the main objectives. So what, what's happened in August, as Tim mentioned, we changed the way we do the visits. And, uh, the sort of next few slides, I'll, I'll sort of explain what we changed. Um, for those of you who may be familiar with uh, the previous process, we've had three 
um, report in, in effect. We had the PG-13 MIR, which was the report form. We had a PG-13 FNG, which was a summary uh, report form. And then we had a PI brief if, uh, if the case was being reported to the Traffic Commissioner's Office. So what, what we wanted to do is we wanted to combine all those and consolidate into one report because that gets quite confusing and bitty. So we wanted to, to have one report to cover all those aspects. And I'll show you the layout in a, in a, in a couple of slides of, of how the new report works. But it's hopefully much more clear and more transparent so everybody can see uh, what's being reported and what the recommendations are um, from, from the whole, you know, just one report rather than having these three bits of reports together. We've changed the way we assess each question. For the previous ones, we had numbers, um, the numbering system. Um, now we've got a meaningful um, answer to a question. Each question can be assessed um, as either satisfactory, most satisfactory, or satisfactory report for OTC. And the highest, um, you know, the most uh, high risk uh, score um, reports for the group of questions. But I'll show you how that works in a second. And we've built some validation and features into the report form that, that the operator gets a copy of which links to our guidance around this as well, which again, I'll explain a lot about, about that in a second. So there's four um, sections to the MRBR. Section one is, is really the details of the investigation, uh, the operator details, examiner details, and it also shows that that first page, the summary of, of all the questions that have been answered and the recommended action. So that's giving you sort of high level view of what the outcome of that. Um, investigation is. Section two goes through all the questions um, to, and all the comments that, that, uh, from the assessment and whether there's any shortcomings on there. So section two is, if you like, the body of the report. Section three uh, deals with the signatures and whether there is any explanation. RFE stands for request for explanation. Uh, so apologies for the acronym, but uh, yes, so that's when we're asking for the operator to, to write back. Uh, if the shortcomings found. Uh, section four is the final section. If there's a response that we were looking for, then there's comments about the response and a final signature box. Um, so let's uh, look at what questions uh, the, uh, or question groups that we've got. So um, if some of these have been um, the same as, as the previous um, investigation, some, some have been updated. So operator legal entity is actually a separate new section now. Um, we've got uh, vehicle emissions on number seven, which is uh, a new section. Uh, some uh, questions have been added to the other sections and I haven't got time today to sort of go through everything. Uh, wheel and time management is a new section, load security, or for PSV operators, that's the PSVAR stands for the accessibility regulations. So there's assessment on that. Uh, number 11 is, a, is for guidance only, and this is where we're trying to um, increase the focus around vehicle and site security for counter-terrorism. So that's some uh, useful questions around sort of make, raising awareness around security for operators. Uh, we've all seen some tragic um, um, terrorist activities, and it's just trying everybody trying their best to, to prevent um, as much as we can that happening. Um, so um, we've left also we've moved the transport manager responsible person assessment to the end of the uh, end of the assessment uh, because overall you know that that's an overall view that the transport manager responsible person are responsible for, for all this. So that's why that's assessed at the end, so that was moved. So a quick look at the layout. This this was one uh, in Blue Peter fashion that was um, that uh, we've just filled it. So it's just an example, uh, as you can see. Uh, so section one is, as I mentioned, that front page, uh, which gives the details of the investigation, the people involved, and then uh, you've got those coloured boxes, which are the assessment groups. Uh, so you can see quite quickly just by a glance of where the problems are. And if you click on one of those numbers, uh, so you can see number four where it's got reports for NTC. So if you click on that number four, it will actually link you straight to that question. Uh, section two 
you can see uh, this is the layout of the question. So obviously we've not got time to go through the, these in detail. But you can see at the top of the page where you've got a little G in a box. So what that does is that will link you straight to the guidance uh, and that'll, um, that they go throughout the document so you can get to the actual guidance around you know, that first question about a legal entity. Um, as you can see in the third uh, question about operation centre, so there's some comments in there and you can see how each question is stored at the side. So MS sounds for mostly satisfactory and S is satisfactory. Um, so you get an idea of, of the format of the, of the report and any comments will be against the question group underneath. So you can see there on uh, question three about the operating centre, that's where the comments will go into that part. Uh, section three, as I mentioned, uh, this opens up if there's, uh, depending on the, uh, whether we need an explanation or not, and it's for the examiner to sign. And when the examiner signs the report, it locks the report down so it can't be edited. And just to confirm, the both operator and transport manager gets a copy of this report directly. So that will be emailed to to uh, to those uh, people. And then section four, um, again, if if we're expecting a response back from the operator. That's where that's collected in section four. As you can see on this particular example, neither the transport manager operator bothered to respond back to us. So that's where that's gone to uh, no replies received. And, and that again gets locked off by the signature by the examiner. And again, the copy will go back to the uh, um, transport manager operator once all sections are completed. So potentially there's going to be two cents one you know with section up to section three and then the final one if section four is completed so something that again we've developed along with the new report is uh, what we call sit cap and what's called it sit cap because uh, if we if we keep saying safety inspection period calculator and analysis tool uh, i think uh, i'll get tongue twisted out so we'll call it sit cap and basically what this is is a standard way uh, our examiners will be analysing maintenance safety inspections, uh, and, it, and basically what it is, it's a, it's a formulated Excel sheet uh, which will calculate automatically calculate the periods, uh, so we can put mixed um, periods in there if we've got mixed maintenance frequency and different vehicle types, different maintenance types. So we'll have a look at this. So basically, what you'll get is the two parts of this analysis is a summary sheet which shows you how many vehicles were, were uh, records were looked at and uh, some of the main issues that we found on the sheets and then we'll look at the, the main analysis in a second so so um you know it'll this summary will give you the number of records checked the number of late inspections worked out on the frequency and whether the inspections were fully completed whether there was dangerous defects found on the inspections, whether there was driver-related defects found on the inspections, so lights out or things hanging off that the driver should have spotted. Um, looked at, looking at brake testing, which again, you know, I think we've, we've talked about brake testing a number of times and how important it is to make sure brakes are checked. Uh, so we can report on that and also whether the inspections have been signed off as roadworthy. Uh, and again, not one to sort of go in this sort of uh, too in depth, but that's a, an example. Again, this is made up of, a, of an analysis that we would do. So uh, what the SIPCAT will do is this is one sheet now for a, a semi-trailer and it's designed so the reader can very quickly pick out where there's problems. So it sort of draws your eye where you've got green obviously is uh, you know, no issues found, whereas you've got amber where there may be comments and may be issues. So, so it's not reporting as unsatisfactory, but there may be some areas that we may need to look at, whereas obviously red will be reporting on that summary of uh, where there's a problem. And you can quickly see on this one particularly, uh, brake testing, there's none being carried out. And then we finally get a couple of uh, results uh, where you've got an unladen roller brake test and then uh, operators got EBPMS, which is the Electronic Brake Performance Monitoring System in place. So it, it's, it is an example, um, but this again will be attached to the case 
the copy will be sent to the operator. So once the analysis is done, you will receive a copy of this uh, because this obviously forms part of the report. So just a, a brief sort of overview of what happens um, before moving on to the, to the next part of the presentation. So pre-visit, as we said, there'd be triggers to actually generate the investigation. So we do background checks on the operator, which can involve going on to the vehicle operator licensing system, any intel. We'll find out what encounters you've had previously because that's probably the focus of the investigation. At the actual visit, there'll be a fleet inspection carried out, so that's where vehicles are checked. Uh, and then there'll be that audit carried out, the maintenance audit, which, which I've sort of just highlighted, uh, the type of thing that we looked at on that. And then, um, as we've mentioned, the MIVR, the maintenance investigation visit report, will be completed and sipped at. And it's probably a combination of being completed at the visit and post visit, particularly, you know, around you now we've got COVID about, uh, records will probably be taken away for analysis rather than trying to do it on site. After the visit, um, as I've shown you, the, um, the maintenance report will be completed, sip cut, uh, and the report will be copied and emailed to the uh, operator, and then there'll be any requests for an explanation and any recommended action letters after that, so you know exactly what's happening. Uh, which has been a problem with the previous one, that operators are not quite sure what, what's happening next. So um, I want to just go through that because it's important that you do know. So satisfactory, which is all good, so there's no further action, so there's no problems, the case gets closed. Uh, most of satisfactory is where we probably recommend some improvements to be made, but there's nothing um, too much of a problem within the visit itself. Unsatisfactory and report to OTC. So this is where we need to see further action. And this is, um, you know, we, we need to highlight the importance of getting the responses back from both the operator and transport manager if it's a standard uh, license. Um, and importantly, um, you have 14 days to, to respond back to shortcomings. If you respond back with satisfactory evidence or acceptable evidence, the case will actually get closed. Although it's unsatisfactory because you provided acceptable evidence, then we will close the case. It will be sitting there as unsatisfactory, but the case doesn't go anywhere else. Um, if we get assurances, so this is something where you, if you like, give promises to put things in place, but it's not actually in place. I'll give you an example of where you've, you've picked up on brake testing, you've agreed to do roller brake testing, for example, then that case gets deferred. And that's deferred for a FU as a follow-up desk-based assessment in six months. So this is where the remote enforcement office will be then after six months coming back to you as, uh, and checking up of, of those assurances, whether you've actually applied those. So the case gets deferred. And as I mentioned, it, it gets followed up by the remote enforcement office. If that's satisfactory, so if you've done everything you said you were going to do, then again, the case gets closed. So report to OTC, obviously in red. <laughs> so um, report will go automatically if we find significant shortcomings uh, in either one of the group question groups. So it can be reported. So if it's an incorrect legal entity, it will automatically go back to OTC. As an example, uh, unsatisfactory response to reported shortcomings. So where we've asked you for responses back from unsatisfactory and you don't send one back, or you send something that isn't suitable, then that would then escalate into OTC. As I mentioned before, most serious infringement would automatically get sent back, and also traffic commission requests will also get sent back. So it could be satisfactory, but it goes back because the traffic commissioners have asked uh, for the investigation. Unsatisfactory variations will go back for a decision uh, to the traffic commissioners. So they can decide whether to grant the variation or what to do with that. And as I've already mentioned about unsatisfactory desk-based assessments will get escalated then. So in six months time, if we find that the assurances haven't been applied, then that will go back to um, the traffic commissions. So that's um, the outcomes from unsatisfactory covered. Um, and there's a list of common failings, so I'll just put them up and then we'll sort of nip through a few. So the main 
sort of issues that we find vehicles not in roadworthy condition. So the records might show everything donkey dory and fine, there's no problems at all. And when we actually inspect the vehicles, there's prohibitions. So that's one of the main issues that we find. Drivers, you know, we talk a lot about drivers not doing what they should be doing about the walk around check and reporting defects. So that is key. And as I come on to that a bit later on. Um, so I sort of, you're going to get this. You can see frequency, um, maintenance records missing. We even, you know, see reports of the maintenance records falsified. Or management control ultimately um, that that's caused causes a lot of this. So common failings. Um, what I'd really encourage you to do if you've not done so already is we publish the guide, which basically covers every question that we would cover in the maintenance investigation. There's lots of links in there to guidance of what you should be doing. So this is on gov.uk. There is a link in the presentation, hopefully, to make it easier to find that. But you can, if you Google it, you'll, you'll get to it very quickly. Um, so I would certainly recommend that you uh, get hold of that and go through it. And if you, if you like, you could do your own little mini audit uh, just to see where you would sit if, uh, if we did actually do a visit. So that's maintenance investigations and what we've changed. Uh, something that we've recently um, put in place, and this again is working with the trade through consultation and with the department. And this is where we've got delayed defects. So these are defects or what we call major defects. So the vehicle isn't immediately dangerous, but it could attract what we call a delayed prohibition. Um, so what, what we've looked at is uh, where these delayed defects actually happen on the journey. So that's de defined as a current day journey within a 24 hour period. So if, it, if, if this major defect appeared on that journey, we will, we will uh, introduce a concession. The other part of this concession is where you want to drive the vehicle to a place of repair. Um, so if that's, you know, two parts of this concession is if it appears on the journey or if you're just driving it to the, the workshop. Importantly, what it doesn't extend to is to allow the vehicle to be driven with dangerous defects. So that's immediate prohibition. And um, equally, if we find other prohibition items on the, on the vehicle, uh, in addition to to one of these delays that have fallen under the concession, then if you like, it's, it, it all bets are off. It all gets dealt with as it would normally. So the concession doesn't apply if you find other, other prohibition items on there. Um, it doesn't allow the vehicle to be used. Um, so if you find the de a delayed defect during your walk around check, it's expected that that's action. So you don't just jump in and use it thinking, I'll be all right, I'll be on the concession. The only caveat to that is if you're driving to a workshop and you can prove you're doing that. So uh, this is what evidence would need to see So for this concession to apply. So the driver would need to show the evidence that they've done their walk around check um, before using the vehicle and it's a nil defect report. Um, this can be done either with a pad in the cab or it can be done more commonly now with an electronic app on a smartphone or something like that, a tablet that, that the uses. So they'd be able to evidence that. And then they'd be also able to evidence that they've notified that this defect's present. So that, that's important that they've actually identified the defect and they've recorded that assessment on, the, on that system and made an assessment that it's still safe to carry on using that vehicle with that defect. So this is where, you know, the, the need to be assessed and done either by the transport manager or if the driver, uh, you know, is, uh, has got the permission to make that assessment. Well, that needs to be written up in or put, put on the um, defect reporting system. Uh, or if it's going to workshop, then we need to have evidence that, you know, it is a, a reported defect and it is en route to, to the workshop. Uh, so that's, um, again, needs to be uh, there at the time of the encounter. So what will happen is, under, under normal circumstances, there would be a delayed prohibition, which obviously attracts OCRS points and you'd have to get it cleared and so on. So it would be deviated, what we call, or downgraded to an inspection notice under these this concession so uh, it is it is shown on the um the encounter that it's an inspection notice so the operator would be required to re repair that and show that in the maintenance system you'll be given a notice 
at the time of the encounter and the, the driver at the operator would need to uh, show in the maintenance system that that's been fixed and so if we ever did investigate that we would see that audit trail uh, as i mentioned before it doesn't apply to other prohibition defects so um you know that the, the encounter would just be uh, dealt with normally if we find other things wrong with it uh, and importantly it's responsibility of the driver to provide the evidence at the time so we're expecting uh, you know two weeks down the line the operator contacting dvsa and saying, no oh, um, the driver had reported this in any of the records so it's got to be there and then as we're dealing with the vehicle at the time at the road check. Uh, just some examples of um, the type of defects, I'm sure there'll be more uh, ones I could think of at the time, of common defects that could have occurred on the journey, the warning lights coming on, cuts, damage in tyres, damage to the wing, you know, if we've hit something on the journey, things like that that could occur uh, during the journey, but would still be able to continue um, with that type of defect. It, it, of course, it is a, an MOT fails, it is an offence, but we, we take on board that, you know, giving you time to actually get this fixed, um, doing the right thing, um, reporting it and making sure that it gets fixed, um, you could avoid having a prohibition. Uh, so it's really important that this message gets across to the drivers um, to do things properly, you could avoid problems with yourselves. And then finally, just to update you about tyres, so you may have read about this, uh, some comms going out um, as, as we get nearer, but um, basically there's going to be a change in tyre legislation or construction use is going to cover the age of tyre and the age marking. So this is the, applicable to the goods vehicles, buses and coaches uh, and minibuses. Um, so it includes the date of retreaded tyre. So uh, when the, if a tyre gets retreaded, that it goes from that date, and basically it makes it illegal to operate um, on the front steel axles um, and single um, uh, tyre configurations on minibuses of uh, tyres over ten, or where there's no date marking as well. Uh, so that's again just something to be mindful of that you need to have a visible date marking on the tyre. An example of where the date marking is there on the 23rd 10. Uh, so you can see that's the week number in the year of the 10. Um, it would attract, if we found that a test, a dangerous defect fail at test. And as we mentioned earlier on about S mark prohibitions, we shouldn't be seeing these, probably not very common. Um, but we shouldn't be seeing these, so it would generate an S mark prohibition, of course, after that follow up. Um, there is a, an exemption for historical, non commercial, historical vehicles. Okay, that's me done. I shall now hand over to Mark. Um, well, thanks very much, Dave, for that really interesting um, presentation. There was a, a mass of information uh, in there, and I've made some notes with about a few things I'd like to pick up on or, or comment about. Um, it was interesting what you were saying about change of entity and how this was mm. this is sort of new um, uh, point that's been, or bullet point that's put into the, uh, to, to your investigation. Um, this is something um, we see very frequently mm. um, where a business has started out perhaps as a sole tradership, has become a partnership, has gone on to become a, a, a limited company or from sole tradership to um, to a limited company um, and um, this is sometimes very prevalent in smaller businesses uh, and one particular thing is with partnerships mm. where you have a change of partners um, and of course that's a change of entity unless you've got a partnership agreement which allows a continuing partnership so that's mm. quite a tricky area that people miss that we encounter quite um, uh, frequently um, the other thing is that I was um, I was interested in what you were saying about um, trigger points for investigations, and in particular, um, the traffic commissioner asking for you to to take a look at the business. Uh, I don't know if this is your experience as well, but um, it, it seems to us we have quite a number of matters that go to public inquiry where the uh, the operator has made an application for a variation to increase mm -hmm. the license or something like that. Um, and uh, 
not is all it all is not well uh, in terms of annual test history prohibitions mm -hmm. it, 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 is that is that your feel for it as well that uh, this is a, a a catalyst or a trigger point yeah yeah absolutely so so um there's two parts of traffic emission requests really what run it one is through the licensing aspect where as you mentioned variations where we do have a you know obviously a lot of variation requests that come in uh, for an assessment uh, so, so they'll initially get assessed um and then uh, as you said you know if there, if there are sort of aspects of the history that may be a concern then that that could lead to either a desk based assessment nowadays uh, or a visit uh, to to uh, to look at that and report back and they they will all get reported back either to licensing uh, to leads or to the local um, traffic commissioner's office depending on the outcome uh, but also you know, so so that that is a, a you know quite right. That does generate a lot of of uh, investigation, but also traffic commissioner requests may come in for they're, they're privy to certain information that we wouldn't have. Their finances being one of them, that may generate a, an investigation just on the back of something like that. Yeah. Um, so so we can get uh, and it, and it could be maybe from the result of a, a previous investigation, uh, public inquiry that then generates a, a follow-up investigation in 12 months time or something like that that would come in yeah. uh, so, so they're the main reasons but yeah, yeah. um break testing you mm. mentioned um i so it appears to be the case uh, that after the um initiative to tighten up on this side of things that there's been significant improvement but nevertheless matters that seem to come to public inquiry that we deal with um, seem to revolve around missing paperwork or operators still not uh, engaging in what is required of them in terms of having a, a performance test at every PMI. Um, have things been getting better? Where, what's the lie of the land at the moment? I think, I think they have um, and you know we, we've got you know, innovations like EBPMS, which is being, uh, you know, operators are starting to, to sort of integrate that within the fleets, which have been helping. Um, and I think I think there still is a bit of a misunderstanding of the guidance of, of being, a, you know, for an inspector to be able to sign off a, an inspection, um, to not have any break assessment done at all, isn't appropriate, you know, and I think this is where there's a bit of a misunderstanding about whether it's as a roller brake test or an actual measured efficiency test or whether there is any assessment at all on the performance. And I think that's where there's some misunderstanding. Um, so, so I think, you know, as, as we've seen uh, with our statistics, brake testing, braking defects are still quite high up, you know, probably the, the highest um, aspect of the tyres that we see. Mm -hmm. uh, at the roadside, and uh, and this is you know still a, still an issue, yeah. um, but I think the guidance you know we, we keep working on the guidance that the, there's a, a brake test working group with the with um, the trade associations, traffic commissions, and the department looking at how we can improve guidance uh, and still um, you know get the message out there. So so there's still work to do, but I think over since 2014 it's definitely improved and there's a much more awareness out there of it. Yeah, uh, and before we move on to uh, the next presentation, the other uh, point I think I was going to make um, is this. I was interested to hear what you've got to say about written responses from mm. operators. And again, from our experience of representing operators at, at, at hearings and trying to guide them through the process, um, I think it's fair to say that a lot of the problems arise by not giving DBSA a really comprehensive reply um, to the questions that are posed and also the actual evidence which you pointed out on what, one of your slides you actually want to see formal documentation as to what people have done to rectify things and yeah. uh, I frequently see emails that have gone you know please will you you say please will you tell us about what you're doing to address the shortcomings and an email is sent to you and it's about five lines long uh, and it and I will say to clients, anything you write to DVSA, assume that it is going to go to DVSA and then on to the traffic commissioner yeah. and will land on his or her desk. 
Yeah, that's quite right. And, uh, you know, that, that is the potential of it. Um, but as we saw in the slides, um, we sort of can react on a couple of ways with the with the evidence or, you know, assurances. And, and there is a bit of guidance about, you know, if it's not clear what we mean by the difference between evidence and assurance. Because uh, if, if we have the evidence and that's that's the only issues, so it might be, I don't know, maintenance contract that's not in place or something like that, where you can get the evidence to us within that time period, then that could close the case and that would be the end of it. Whereas assurance would be, as I said, it is sort of more of a promise that you'll do something mm -hmm. where we need to follow that up. So there, there is a bit of guidance around that. And of course, making making sure that you actually act on those because uh, you know it, it wouldn't be seen um you know in you know traffic commissions certainly wouldn't um look at it favorably if you've, ass you've assured us that you do something and then you haven't uh, so you know don't fall into that trap by writing back to us and then don't do anything yeah yeah create blue water behind you so that if there's a hearing or something in due course you've got a track record showing that um you know things weren't necessarily great originally but you've, you've actually addressed it yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, and importantly from uh, an operator licensing point of view um the traffic commissioner can have confidence that you today can comply and get things yeah. right going forward in the future yeah. sure okay okay well well thanks tim um thanks for inviting me along uh, to uh, speak to um speak to you about what um, our traffic examiners are going to be looking at when they uh, come out to an operator visit. Um, I'm Mark Horton, by the way. I work with Dave as well in the uh, uh, policy policy team. I tend to manage all the things that aren't vehicle related, so that's more to do with driver's hours, driver CPC, um, documentation, etc. Um, there's a few other bits and bobs anyway. Um, so I'm going to uh, share my screen and uh, run through this presentation with you now. Um, so hopefully you're seeing that it comes up. Okay, so um, there, there's a bit of a, a, an overview of um, what I'm going to be talking about. So I'm going to um, first of all talk about when, uh, why we might come out, so why a traffic examiner might come out to uh, visit you and, and uh, look at your systems. I think it's, it's inevitable as well that there has been an impact on on the work of the DVSA during the last year or so because of COVID-19. So you might find things are a little different now, both in terms of what you'll see at the side of the road and what will happen when we come out to your premises as well. So I'm going to talk a, a little bit about that as well. Um, just run through some of the most frequent driver's hours infringements that we tend to find as well. And then I'm going to um, go on to the actual visit itself and talk to you about what we're expecting to see when we come out there. And covering those those sort of four main areas that I've written down there, but that's not exhaustive. That's just probably four of the the the, the main parts um, that we're going to be talking to you about. Uh, and then I'm, I'm at the end of it, we'll just go through a bit of a summary. So, um, why would we come and visit you in the first place? Then, well, unfortunately, DVSA no longer um, has the opportunities really in the time to visit compliant operators. So. Um, when I first joined the organisation a number of years ago now, um, it wouldn't be unusual for one of our examiners to drop by their local operator, have a cup of tea, introduce themselves and um, you know, maybe provide some advice and guidance. Um, but that's not to say that whenever we come out now, uh, you're always going to be on the receiving end of some form of enforcement action. Um, in fact, the outcome from most of our visits um, results in the operator being helped to become more compliant by introducing improved processes or tweaking existing working practices. So obviously we're going to be providing some guidance and advice to help you with that. Um, that said, it's, un it's usually something um, that's gone wrong that's going to trigger uh, a, a visit by one of our examiners. So whether that's a mechanical defect, so the sort of things that Dave was talking to you about, um, that was identified at the roadside, or whether it's an overload or that could have easily been avoided or other infringements identified as part of that roadside encounter. So it might be um, driver's hours or MSI offences, etc. cetera. Um, our examiners have an enforcement sanctions policy document as well, and that advises them uh, how to deal with certain circumstances. Um, probably uh, be a good idea if you've not seen that to, to go and find that document, which is on the gov.uk website 
and that will give you a, a, quite a lot of information. Um, if it's a, a driver error that we find at the side of the road, um, the chances are we're probably not going to take that um, any further. So, for example, um, if a driver has exceeded their hours due to their own poor time management, then we're unlikely to progress that um, progress that issue. But um, conversely, if, if it turns out that it's um, a problem that was caused by the transport manager, I know maybe making unrealistic demands of the driver, we will, of course, want to discuss that with the transport manager and the operator as well to, to find out why that was the case. Uh, we also receive requests from the traffic commissioner um, and the office of the traffic commissioner to visit operators. So that might be to investigate an environmental complaint or to make sure that conditions placed on a license are being adhered to. Um, this could happen when a license is first applied for uh, or at any other time for that matter. And increasingly, though, um, you're going to find now that we have removed uh, moved to um, remote enforcement. Uh, obviously, this is uh, related to COVID, um, but uh, it may well have been in the past as well that you have been approached by our, our remote enforcement office. And this is really a lot about us making the best use of our resources. Um, it, it clearly makes sense for lesser issues to be dealt with this way rather than potentially wasting both our time and the operator's time investigating a relatively minor issue which can be resolved either over the phone or um, you know, via a, a couple of emails. Um, so just while I mentioned that, then COVID-19, it, it of course has had an impact uh, on the way we work this year. And it's seen us rely more on, on remote enforcement to ensure that we keep um, the well-being of our examiners and uh, customers, drivers, etc., as a priority. So this initially meant that roadside encounters just concentrated on external construction use uh, inspections at the roadside. So you, you would have found that um, we wouldn't have interacted very much at all with the driver. Um, and that was why we uh, sort of got our heads around all the government guidance and, and put all the uh, appropriate PPE and, and uh, other um, issues in place at the roadside. But we did slowly reintroduce driver's hours checks. Initially, we did that retrospectively. Uh, but then we uh, started taking the driver cards off the drivers before eventually uh, we did uh, start getting back into cabs. So you'll find that we were doing full downloads and also doing full construction use encounters. But this has meant uh, some changes to the way we work, with the inevitable consequence being, of course, that um, our checks have taken a bit longer than normal. So uh, we would ask you to bear with us if you do um, you know, get encountered the roadside. Um, and on the plus side, our check sites now are probably a lot cleaner than they have been in the past. And we've been getting through um, piles of PP as well, as you can imagine. Uh, so our remote enforcement office um, has been dealing with the lesser issues remotely for, for a number of years. So they'll request information of the operators uh, to see if a face-to-face -face visit um, is actually necessary. And, and that's been expanded quite a lot during 2020 to matters which might ordinarily have involved a visit. So the REO... Um, have been heavily involved as well in our virtual new operator seminars, but I'll talk to you a little bit about them about that later. Um, so we, we've used the desk-based assessment approach uh, as a way to check operators, uh, which might ordinarily have slipped through the net. So one of the areas of work we were doing this year is because we were um, weren't undertaking as many checks at the roadside. We have a number of um, examiners who were having to work from home as well because of uh, maybe medical conditions and or they were shielding, et cetera. So we, we took advantage of that to, to start looking at some of the grey fleet. So these are operators that have a grey OCRS score. Um, I'm hoping you know what the operator compliance risk score is, um, but I'm sure we, we can go through that at the end if anybody has a question on that. Um, and uh, you, you'd be a grey OCRS operator if there's been a lack of interaction between ourselves and the EVSA. Um, so what we're trying to do there is then have a look at an operator remotely by requesting documents so that we can establish um, how compliant they are. Um, and if we do identify problems at that stage, then we can offer the guidance and advice um, to steer them down um, in the right direction rather than waiting till we pull them to the side of the road where, with the potential, of course, that we might find problems. So some of you might have um, had to deal with these requests from our examiners. Um, probably during the spring and summer this year. And we'll be requesting various information to help us understand your operation and identify any shortcomings that we could help you with. 
So this would usually involve us requesting maintenance records, driver detail reports, PMIs, etc., any records of interim repairs, and of course, driver's hours and working time directive records. Um, we'd also have a look at the test and enforcement history to see if there's any issues there. And then, um, based on all the information that you provide us, we'd, we'd be providing you with some guidance um, where appropriate. Now, if all things are okay, um, or the problems identified relatively minor, then it's likely to be the end of the matter. If, however, we do find a few other problems, um, then it may well be that we um, ask for some explanations so that you can provide us um, with details on what you're going to do. And then depending upon the detail you provide in that response, we'll either plan to do a further remote visit in six months' time. So really what we're doing there is making sure that you have put those um, uh, changes in place to, to make sure you're compliant. Um, but if we're not satisfied, we might um, have to come back and arrange a face-to-face -face visit with you, which obviously is more likely to involve uh, a, a more detailed investigation of the systems that you have got in place. Now, um, earlier I mentioned the new operator seminars, um, which we expect all new operators to attend. So prior to the pandemic, we ran these across the whole DVSA network as a classroom session, usually take about half a day or so. Um, and these will be delivered by our tropical um, vehicle examiners. Well, but obviously um, we've not been able to do that. And so we've introduced the remote version, which again is, is hosted by our examiners and they deliver a slightly abridged version of the seminar. This has been running now since, um, since August. Um, and we've had a lot of very positive feedback from operators. I think they appreciate the fact that these seminars uh, don't take up as much time. It can be fitted in around other commitments. Um, however, uh, I would say that it is important that operators do attend these sessions, um, as is expected of them by the Traffic Commissioner. And we do report back to the Traffic Commissioner if somebody doesn't attend. Now, initially, we did offer this as, as a sort of a stopgap. So we we wrote out to operators who were due to attend the seminar and said, look, if you want to attend a virtual seminar, we're going to start running these. But if you'd rather wait until we get back to um, whatever normal is these days, um, you can do that and you can attend a face-to-face -face um, face -face seminar. However, that's not looking like it's going to happen for the foreseeable future. So we are going to be um, continuing with the uh, virtual new operator seminars. So if you initially did, um, respond or if the operator decided to wait for face to face, we are going to get back in touch with those operators now um, and ask them to attend the virtual one. Um, but of course, if, if there is a, a, a genuine reason why they can't do that, then we will um, take that into account. Um, so, moving on then, the top five driver's hours infringements. So as you can see there, there's um, five main areas that I've, I've highlighted. And th these are the, um, the sort of things that we're finding both at the side of the road when we stop vehicles over and do uh, driver card downloads and vehicle unit downloads. Um, and also when we go to the operator premises and, and start looking at further records. Now driver's hours obviously can be complicated to understand, um, particularly if you're new to the industry. And I think this highlights the need for drivers and operators to ensure that they're familiar with the rules and also that route planning takes um, account of the limitations that these um, these regulations in, impose upon the, the driver. And of course, of course things do um, don't always go as planned with traffic and accidents making it difficult for drivers to remain within the rules, which again is, is why it's important that some flexibility is built into that route planning. Um, an analogy that we use uh, is that you don't wait for a tire to be worn out before you replace it. Most operators uh, adopt a risk-based approach and replace tyres earlier. And the same principle should really apply to drivers' hours. So don't plan a route which relies on the driver um, driving in perfect conditions uh, to enable them to, to you know, take a break, bang on four and a half hours. Um, of course, building in some flexibility is going to go a long way to addressing some of the problems that, that your drivers will find out there um, on a daily basis. Um, and we suspect that the, the way the different rules interact as well, so your maximum driving periods, regular and reduced daily rest, etc., is one of the reasons for the high number of insufficient daily rest offences, um, which obviously is the, the biggest slice of the pie in, in that um, chart that I'm showing you there. Um, and it's certainly not the most straightforward rule. Uh, it must be particularly difficult for new drivers and those 
them who do not drive all the time, so you're occasional drivers. So hopefully this gives you an idea of um, the problems that we're finding in those, those specific areas and maybe um, something that you could gear up uh, and any educational material that you give your drivers uh, to, to address those, those actual, um, uh, you know, those infringing there. So then um, coming to the actual visit itself. So uh, the purpose of when a traffic examiner is going to come out, um, and very similar to the vehicle examiner as well, but we're going to be looking at your management systems. Um, we're going to ask you a series of questions that's going to be in, in sort of built into topics, which I'll, I'll go through over the next few slides. And then we're going to start rating how effective your system is. Um, so as you can see there, there's going to be three main areas. The first one is going to be that your system is fully effective and working satisfactory. Then at the opposite, opposite end of the scale, then uh, there's going to be systems um, that, that aren't effective, basically. Um, there's no process in place, um, or if there is a process in place, it's not working um, at all. And then uh, somewhere in between, but it's not always an option, though, depending upon the areas that we are asking questions on. It will either be effective or it won't be. There won't be any middle ground, but that, that'll become apparent though when the examiners go through that. Um, so when the examiner has been through all your systems, they'll have a good understanding of your level of compliance uh, and what the next steps are. In the worst case scenarios, so this is going to be where the operator is going to have ineffective or no system, in, no systems in place in a number of areas, then a report will be sent to the traffic commissioner. If most of the systems are effective with the odd short coming here and there, we will advise the operator and request some assurances as to what they will do to address those problems. And that may result in a, in a further visit in the future, either face-to-face -face or via a deathbed assessment. So going back to what I said in the earlier slide, you know, if we can do that remotely, then we will do that, but there will be circumstances when we will need to come back to you. And again, picking up on... Um, Something else that's very important is that if we do request documents to help us assess um, your systems um, doing that remotely, um, please do send everything that you can. Uh, generally, we don't um, we don't complain that we get too much information. It's usually the other way around. So there you go. Um, you should also be aware that a negative visit will uh, have an impact on your OCRS score as well. So if we do come around and find lots of problems, then it will affect your OCRS which, of course, will uh, lead to additional target targeting at the side of the road. So um, going through some of the different areas then and, and starting off with the um, transport manager. So um, some straightforward questions here, really. Is a transport manager in position uh, specified on the licence? Well, they either are or they aren't, so there's no middle ground there. Um, you need to remember to keep on top of any changes of personnel and make sure they are suited and qualified. So the next one is about um, the levels of control that your transport manager does have. So they, they are expected to have um, effective and continuous control and manage the transport activities of the, operation, of the operator. So we're looking at things like vehicle management, um, vehicle maintenance management, verification of transport contracts and documents, assignment of loads or services to drivers and vehicles, verification of safety procedures. And of course, they'll also need to have an oversight of driver monitoring and checking, so driver's hours, et cetera, driving licenses. Now, whether they do that themselves or supervise others, of course, will depend upon the size of the operator, but you'd have to be able to demonstrate to us um, that you do have control um, and that you do interact, uh, interact with your colleagues that are doing the same sort of areas. And if you can tick most of those, uh, then that will be considered an effective system course, less control would indicate a less effective system. Now, can the transport manager, um, transport manager demonstrate continuous development? So this is something you'll find that the traffic commission is very keen on. So they want the transport manager or the uh, responsible person to be bang up to date with the various legal requirements and current changes and issues that impact um, on the transport sector. So you've got to be able to demonstrate that a good repute, be professionally competent, and exercise that continuous and effective management that I just talked about. And you must also be able to provide a suitable certificate of qualifications or entitlement. So it's not enough uh, for a transport manager to have passed um, a CPC qualification several years ago. Um, you know, as we know, the transport industry is, is very dynamic, technology is changing all the time. Um, and the current political and legal environment that you're working in as well um, presents all sorts of challenges. And I think this year has probably demonstrated that 
um, a lot more than than maybe some other years. And of course, we're about to come to the end of the transitional period as well. So there's going to be some more challenges um, you would imagine coming in next year. So um, a good example as well this year has been the change to the driver's hours regulation. So the mobility package came into force in August this year, um, and that made some fairly significant changes to those driver's hours rules. So it's important that transport managers are well versed in those changes, and then in turn educate their drivers to avoid any potential infringements. Okay, so um, it's very important as well that if you're involved in international haulage, um, that you're aware of what is going to happen at the end of this uh, transitional period. I know that there's been a lot of information that's been put on the gov.uk website. So if you're going anywhere near Kent uh, from the 1st of January, you will need to be well aware of, of what's going on there. Um, and I would recommend that you do a bit of research um, on the uh, gov.uk. And also, uh, you know, keep, keep on top of um, any information that uh, the DVSA sends out. Um, so then, moving on to the driver. So, um, training needs to be appropriate to the business. So we all know that drivers need to undertake 35 hours training every five years for the CPC. And ideally, we want the operator to do a number of things, uh, which, of course, needs evidencing here. So we'd like the operator to arrange the courses to the driver to make sure that they are delivered by a professionally qualified provider and relevant to the type of work undertaken by the operator. And um, ideally, again, to address any weaknesses or gaps in the driver's knowledge, rather than just going through the motions of attending courses to tick, tick the CPC box. So ideally, we would expect the training to be delivered or attended in company time. We'd also like to see some sort of induction for new drivers, the content of which, of course, would depend on the nature of the work undertaken and linked to the experience of the driver. You should then be, you should then be able to show us um, how driver CPC is monitored. This driver might be on a different training cycle, so you need to know when, when they're due to complete um, their training. What we don't want to see um, a driver simply being left to fend for themselves. Even if the drivers are not responsible, say, for loading or offloading uh, a vehicle, it's important that they know what to do if the load shifts in transit. So any training given, again, should be done so by somebody qualified to do so, either in-house or at a training establishment, because the driver is responsible for that load as soon as it gets on the, on the road. So it is important they know what to do if something unfortunate does happen. Um, and a less effective system might see the operator providing the driver with maybe just some written learning material to read or some very basic training by a colleague. Um, and, and whilst that's acceptable, it would fall into that middle ground. Um, so that's that sort of less effective system. And for those operators who just assume the driver knows about load security because they've been driving for a number of years and not um, intervening in any way to provide training, then you know, I'm afraid that wouldn't be considered acceptable. It's also the same with hazardous goods as well. So we know that drivers um, would, would need an ADR qualification, um, but operators shouldn't just assume that's sufficient because the driver might have spent many years delivering low hazardous bulk items. Um, and if that was the case, you wouldn't expect them to know how to handle a tanker or um, the dangers of hauling more dangerous loads, in which case we would expect some training and induction to take place. Um, driving license checks and the frequency. Well, this needs to be risk-based, so three months is the norm, not six. Um, and this should be increased if the drivers have points or during probationary periods. Any system must use DVLA's facilities or similar. A visual check of a paper licence, obviously, is no longer acceptable. And you also need to be wary of any drivers who obtain their licence in another, um, another country and who now work for you and reside in the UK because they may not have exchanged their license for a UK one. And whilst that's not initially a legal requirement, I would help encourage you to get them to do this um, as soon as you can, because that will enable you to monitor those licenses a lot better. Okay, so moving on to driver's hours then. So this is uh, probably the, the area where you're gonna find that our examiners will spend most of their time. And it goes without saying that careful planning of journeys and taking into account potential traffic spots, weather, etc., can ensure that a driver maintains or remains within their hours. Beyond the obvious, we would expect the best operators to communicate with their drivers on a regular basis and provide feedback on performance, highlighting where infringements have happened and why this might be the case. 
but it has to be a two-way conversation. So operators should listen to drivers and make appropriate changes based on feedback provided. So after all, it's the driver, um, if he can't make a delivery slot because the, the real-world driving conditions are different to what the sat-nav predicts, then you might need to make some changes. So that route planning is really key to, to making sure that drivers can remain compliant. Drivers might um, be required to produce printouts as well at the roadside from time to time. So that might be our, um, our examiners or the police asking for technical records because they need to make a manual record of an un unforeseen delay. So therefore, you need to have an effective system to ensure that drivers always have sufficient paper, that it's the correct paper for the TACO fitted. And where manual records are recorded, you need to make sure the driver returns them in a timely manner. So that's within 28 days. And of course, then you need to store them correctly so that you can produce them to us if required um, and also um, keep them for the appropriate amount of time. Monitoring the hours worked by your drivers obviously is an essential part of, um, of your management system. So in order to do this, you need to download the driver's card and vehicle unit. Regulations stipulate when this must happen, so the driver's card every 28 days and the vehicle unit after 90 days. However, we would want to see uh, an effective system which is risk-based. So for example, how often you download the driver's card might depend on how well that driver performs based on the analysis of their records or the amount of driving undertaken. So a driver involved in lo um, occasional local driving might require a different approach to one who is um, on the road every day tramping around the UK. I mean, it seems fairly obvious to say that, but um, you'd be surprised how many operators just, just um, do what they need to do to meet what the regulations say. And uh, an integral part the wrong way. So an integral part of, of a driver management um, system is to analyse the downloaded records to check on compliance. So operators also need to check compliance with the mobile working time directive as well. And it's the operator's responsibility to ensure that their drivers do not exceed the average and maximum working weeks during any reference period. It's not sufficient just to check the driver's card either. So operators need to compare the driver card with the vehicle unit. So that's downloading both and comparing them next to each other. You need to also look for things like missing mileage and ensure that time away from the vehicle is correct, correctly recorded. Um, where the analysis highlights problems or infringements, these should be brought to the driver's attention and the operator must be able to provide evidence of this. So simply getting the driver to sign an infringement sheet without any support or an escalation of that disciplinary process is never going to be considered effective. We would expect an operator to firstly check the infringements carefully to make sure they are genuine, um, of genuine concern before raising them with the driver. So for example, if you've got three or four infringements where the driver has exceeded four and a half hours driving by a minute here and there over a couple of months, then it's not necessary, necessarily an indication of a major problem. However, if it happens every day, it might be. So in those cases, we want the operator to talk to the driver to find out um, what the problem is. After all, it could be down to poor planning or the use of a particular route during rush hour. Um, the cause is it. So if it's the driver's fault, why is that the case? Do they understand the rules? If not, would some additional training be more beneficial than a warning letter? If a disciplinary is the correct approach, how does it escalate? And is it proportionate to the issues identified? Operators can view um, our sanctions policy, which I mentioned that early on, our enforcement sanctions policy. Um, and, and that tells you what triggers action uh, by our examiners at the side of the road. So it might be whether we provide advice, whether we go down the fixed penalty route, or in the most serious cases, if we um, offer a prosecution. So you could use that to inform the way that you deal with your drivers as well. Um, we frequently come across operators where the drivers have signed uh, for the same offences month after month with nothing put in place by the operators to actually address the root cause um, or a disciplinary system that goes around in circles. Some operators turn this on their head and they reward compliance. So, for example, if you have a driver that hasn't committed any infringements in a particular period of time, there might be a way that you can reward that driver. Um, and, and that might then encourage them and motivate them to, to be more careful in the future. Um, you should also make sure that you have some me um, method for managing agency drivers. So you need to be asking them um, if they are suitably trained or qualified for the type of driving, driving you need them for, um, how much they've done prior to taking over um, your vehicle. And ideally, you'd want to check their driver's, driver's hours first via a car download. So don't just take the word for it. 
end of the day, it's your operator license that's at risk you know, if anything goes wrong, even though they are an agency driver. Okay, so just moving on to the um, next area. So there's a few other bits and bobs as well that, that we're going to look at. So um, driver's hours is going to take a bulk of that time, but we're going to start looking at some of these other areas as well. So, uh, you know, we expect you to have a, a system in place to flag up when vehicles you know, need testing and when vehicle excise duties due and insurance, etc. So we might check those in advance uh, of the visit to see that specified vehicles are tested and taxed, etc. Um, and where they are not, we would expect a suitable explanation or evidence of a VOR, if that's the case. What we wouldn't expect, though, is you to rely on a third party, such as a maintenance contractor, to monitor that for you. Again, it's your operator license, and it's not theirs that's at the stake. It's also the same for tachograph calibrations and speed limiter functionality. Make sure you know when checks are due and the drivers make you aware of any potential problems with the speed limiter. Depending on how you download your tachograph information, you will be able to obtain speed data. So make use of that as well. If the driver's exceeding the limit, is there a problem with the speed limiter or is it the driver? We also expect an operator to make use of uh, systems such as VOL um, to keep the licenses up to date with vehicle movements um, both on and off the license reported and updated via the online system. You should also monitor your OCRS score, because we will be. If you don't understand um, where you are in that rating, so the um, OCRS is a, is a red, amber, green rating system, um, you can obtain a report and it will tell you um, exactly how clear counters and, and uh, negative counters affect your score and how you move up and down through that rating system. And whilst it might be too late if you start checking it retrospectively, um, it will enable you to realise where you are on there and start putting effective systems in place now to ensure that your compliance score moves in the right direction in the future. It's very simple to sign up to these facilities as well. You just need to go on the gov.uk website. Um, if you Google DVSA and, and then follow the, the instructions, then you, you'll, you'll find out exactly what to do if you haven't already done that. Um, and part of your operator license undertaking concerns uh, where you keep your vehicle. You would not expect to turn up uh, your, to your um, operator site and, and find that you've got your fleet parked all over the industrial estate um, because there's not enough uh, space on your on, on your actual site for vehicles. So you also need to make sure um, you notify the OTC of any changes in your operating centre, including any problems you might have trying to follow any environmental restrictions that you have in the on you. Um, and where an operator has an important history, we would expect to see a suitable response. So, for example, if the operator has picked up a number of prohibitions for low security in the past, we will want to see how this has been addressed. So this could be additional training, which ideally should be linked to driver's EPC, or, or by the purchase of new load security solutions, for example. If an operator has previously attended a public inquiry, we would expect to see evidence that they have put in place any TC recommendations, such as a third-party audit. The last thing we want to see is that the same problems are still occurring that led to the last public inquiry, because that will just involve you um, visit straight back to the TC, highlighting the fact that you haven't actually addressed the problems and shortcomings in the past, as well as highlighting anything else that we might have found um, during that latest visit. So um, that's really, really it for me. I mean, I've, I've cantered through some of the areas there and. and talked about what our examiners expect to see and, and in some cases what we don't expect to see. And um, talked a little bit about a risk-based approach. Um, that's something that traffic commissioners will talk to you about as well. They don't want to see everybody doing the same thing because operators obviously um, are very different in terms of, of what they're doing, what they're delivering, the amount of time spent on the road, and that needs to inform, um, inform the systems that you're putting in place. And there's a lot of information out there to help you. Um, so obviously sign up to OCRS and involve, but also uh, start looking at some of the information that's on gov.uk. There's an awful lot of information. Sometimes it's not as easy to find as you'd like, but, but it is there. There's loads of guides. Obviously, Dave's spoken about the guide to maintaining roadworthiness, but there's a lot of information on driver's hours as well and working time directory, um, working time directive stuff as well. Use CPC to benefit your operation. Um, and put there that the training should be focused and relevant. Um, we, we do see it so frequently that training is just being done to tick a box. Um, there's a lot of training courses out there, 
probably some are better than others, admittedly, but um, make it relevant to, to again to what the drivers are doing, um, and, and then that's going to benefit you as well in the long run. So, of course, transport is a fast-moving and in, in dynamic industry. You can probably say that more so now because of what's been going on, you know, in, in, out there in, with COVID and, and the transitional period coming to an end. So you need to make sure that your systems are flexible enough to keep up with those changes. You can't just in, in introduce the system four or five years ago and expect it to still be fit for the purpose now because things have changed so much. And, and then really just a bit of a statement at the end there, um, compliance shouldn't be an aspiration, it should be the norm. Um, and really that's what we want, want to see from you um, and we'll help you as much as we can achieve that um, compliance when we come out and visit you. But of course, if we do find shortcomings, then we, we do have to take the appropriate action. Um, so that's it really, so um, thanks for listening. Can I follow up a few points that you um, that you made in the presentation? There's a huge amount, you know, an invaluable presentation with a huge amount of information in there, uh, just as there was in, 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 in Dave. Um, and yes, I, you know, we take on board the point you made about keeping up to date. I suppose it's fair to say that, um, <clears throat> um, you know, the standard is the, the standard is the same. You've got to be compliant, but you've got to keep up to up to date with things. Um, and I, I just thought I might pick up about transport management deficiencies um, because you you had a slide there about, uh, you know, the, the pivotal role of the nominated transport manager. Um, have you got any view about where you think transport manager deficiencies sit? I mean, you you mentioned ongoing training, other things, but do you you know from an operational point of view, do we, where do you think you know the key problems lie that need to be addressed? I think one one of the one of the problems that we find, and, and I hear this from from traffic examiners who have been out to to visit these operations, is that. Um, in some cases, there's a lot expected of a transport manager uh, and that they get dragged dragged around into all different places within the business. Um, they might find themselves driving and, and it doesn't um, have, have provide them with sufficient time to do the actual checking and the monitoring that they need to do to make sure everything else is, is compliant. And, and I think that that's something that we do find quite a lot, that it, it's there's a lot for them to do so they need the time to be able to do that rather than trying to you know run run, um, run errands or, or do the driving as well themselves yeah so they're pulled in another way in other directions i mean you obviously oh. some transport managers are the director and some transport managers are a driver and some transport managers are transport managers but they're isolated and and, and things like that it appears to be the, yeah, it appears to be the sort of a, lots of different ways in which it it, it, it doesn't work. Um, it was interesting to it was interesting to hear what you're saying about roadside. Uh, sorry, the uh, remote enforcement, the desk-based assessment. Um, and you may agree. I think it's it's fair to say, following on the point I made to Dave earlier um, about investigations. Um, I think it's the case that when these letters are received from um, from DVSA. To send in data, send information. Often they're not um, they're not particularly comprehensive replies on the part of the the operator, or it's a bit sort of haphazard. Yeah, and and of course there's a concern then that if if we don't get all the information that we're requesting, that um, what's the reason for that? Are, are there not records in the first place, or, or are the operators not willing to share something with us? So it is really important that the that the operators do provide as much information as they can that, that certainly addresses everything that we ask for. Yeah. Um, and we're not going to complain if they send us more information. You know, we, we're going to look through it anyway, and, and you know, we're not going to start um, sending stuff back um, and complaining about the, the volume of stuff that's sent to us. So, um, I yeah. Can I just go on to your slide about driver's hours? A couple of points about... Um the propensity to offend and uh, also working time. Um, I was quite interested by the slide that you put up there showing that effectively half of infringements are um, on daily rest offences. Yeah. Um, I don't know, perhaps it's because I've just been dealing with a large number of restricted operators on local runs that have 
um, four and a half hour offences prevalent recently that it, it feels a bit odd. But why 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 is this? Are there a lot of non UK operators, international foreign operators amongst that fifty percent? Yeah, I, I think that's probably fair to say. We we do stop a lot of non UK uh, haulies at the side of the road. So probably over fifty percent of the vehicles that we encounter are non UK. So we do get a lot a lot of um, daily rest fences from them because of course they're, they're travelling a lot further. Um, so that's that's one of the reasons. So that that might um, disproportionately affect those figures. But I think also it, it's. It's a complicated rule, isn't it? And and there's lots of other rules that interact with it that can cause you to, to you know, not to take sufficient daily rest. So um, I, I think there's a, a, a bit of a misunderstanding sometimes because of the complicated nature of that, which you can tell about driver's hours in general. You know, there is a lot a lot for drivers to take on board, lots of different rules. Well, um, moving on from that, which is, I suppose, a, a good example of it, is brake offences and, and, and working time brakes. Um, I, I don't know if you're able to comment about that, but I get the feel that when I see papers, public inquiry papers and, and, and DBSA reports, that there's been a, a sort of greater, more in-depth look at working time infringements uh, in the last couple of years, whereas before, basically, it was more concentrated on the EU rules and sort of the... The, the working time stuff was a bit of an afterthought. I mean, has there is there any deliberate policy change on that, or is, or emphasis, or how do you how do you look on working time compared to the EU rules? <laughs> there shouldn't be any more emphasis on that than drivers' hours. I think that we we do have a go at our examiners sometimes for not paying enough attention to it. So it, it might be an indication that that we've been banging on at them that that it is an integral part of that visit. So they might be paying more attention to it. But there's not been any concerted effort on working time. Um, but I think the thing with drivers' hours is you know we we, we do drivers' hours at the roadside, but um, working time is very much something that we do at the operator premises because clearly a driver is not going to be able to produce the records at the side of the road to show compliance with some some of the working time requirements. So that might be another reason for it, you know, the average working week and, and things like that. Um, and, and, and finally, um, you mentioned in the early part of the presentation OCRS, which, you know, some operators are still not signed up for, uh, it seems to me, um, and, and if, if not also, um, BOL system, and of course they can't do anything to manage their licenses in effect unless they're, they're, they're doing it online, certainly not applications. Um, but can you just expand on the bit about the grey fleet, what the grey fleet is and, 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 and what you're doing there in a bit more detail? So, so the, the, the grey fleet are, um, are operators that haven't really um, come on to our agenda, if you like. We haven't encountered them at the side of the road. Um, we've got very, very limited information on them. So we, we don't know whether they are compliant or non-compliant. So we give them this grey status, which should see them stopped by our examiners at the side of the road. But but in terms of priority, they're probably going to stop a red operator above a grey operator. So what, what we did at the um, start of the sort of restrictions brought in by COVID, looking at the work that we could get um, our examiners to do that were stranded at home, uh, was to address the, the grey fleet and start looking at, at these operators um, to find out whether they were compliant or non-compliant. So we used the desk-based assessment as a way to, first of all, request the information, obviously, and then to assess, them, assess the operators and, and then help them and advise them so that they would be heading in the right direction, if you like, rather than waiting for those roadside encounters, which... Um, you know, they, they could potentially be dis disadvantageous to them because we're going to find a problem and immediately going to put them into red. So it was a case of trying to catch them before that, if you like, because we had the time to do that. And we, we also did um, other targeted desk-based assessments as well. So we didn't concentrate just on the Grey Fleet. We looked at other operators as well um, that gave us cause for concern. So again, rather than waiting to come across them at the side of the road, uh, we, we sort of... Uh, got the bull by the horns and, and requested information off them as well to help steer them in the right direction. Okay. And again, as you've said, requesting all that the information that they'd have available so that we could make uh, a rough assessment of how compliant they were and then 
um, provide them with that advice, um, you know, if, if we did identify any problems. Thanks very much. Um, final point. In fact, I think it may it may be that Dave can pick up on this one. It was uh, it was uh, an issue that uh, occurred to me earlier, and I didn't um, mention it. Could you just explain the situation, Dave, in relation to small overruns? Um, you know, if you're on eight weeks, but it says 8.3 or 8.5 days, or you you slip into a you know the ninth week, 9.1 something like that. So what's DVSE's approach when you're doing your maintenance inspections to that type of scenario? When do you regard it as a breach and not? Yeah, okay. So it's a good question and, and something we, we updated at um, probably about 2014 where we got some clarity over this of, of when. So, so if you're working out per day, so six weeks or, or 42 days, um, that was quite problematic if you went over by one day then you know you could be considered a breach so back in 2014 we agreed an approach for if the inspection is completed within the week it falls so we use an ISO week so that's Monday to Sunday so as long as it's done within that week then that would be classed as meeting the requirements uh, so you know for an example if it was due on Tuesday if you counted per day from the last inspection, you could do it any time that week from Monday to Sunday and it would be considered within the frequency. If you go over the ISO week, so you get drop into the next one, so you go into the following Monday of that week, then that would be a breach. So you've got to be careful if you're arranging inspections on a Sunday that it suddenly then goes over to the next ISO week and you go past midnight. So just be mindful of that uh, when you when you're working these uh, schedules out. Okay. Um, well, I think this concludes this part of the uh, of the session. Um, can I just take this opportunity to thank you both of you very much indeed for for, for giving us so much information and 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 giving us uh, your valuable uh, time. Uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to go into the question uh, and answer. Uh, session part of uh, of this webinar. So again, thanks very much for, for taking part. We'll deal with all the questions. If there are any questions and answers we can't deal with um, because it's this isn't the, the best forum, then we'll we'll follow that up in in writing. So um, thanks very much indeed for taking part in this webinar. Just for your information, if you go onto our website, you'll see other um, uh, webinars that are advertised, particular employment uh, webinars uh, dealing with furloughing, redundancy, job retention scheme and things like that, which you will find very useful um, uh, for, your, for your businesses. Um, so thanks very much uh, again for taking part in this.